Howdy. So how do you make the world a better place? Well, how about we start with education? How does education start? How do we teach our children in kindergarten? Playing games, right? Through play, through games. That's how we formally introduce education to students, to the future generation. But then something happens when they turn six, seven, or eight, and we put them in benches, in rows, and a sage on the stage, just like me right now here in front of you all, and we call that effective education, about 20, 25 students in a classroom. Now, I'm not a doctor, nor a psychologist. When students turn 18, something happens, because now effective education is 150 students in rows with a sage on the stage like myself, and we call that effective education universities all across the world. And that's how we teach. Now let me ask you a question. How do we learn how to ride a bike? Simple bicycle. Do we learn by reading about it? By watching somebody do it? Or by listening somebody talk about it? We learn riding a bike by actually doing it. He had the classroom experience watching, reading, and listening. And it has been like this for hundreds of years. And it hasn't really changed. Yet our world has changed dramatically over the last 100 years. Just in the last 10 years, um, things have really changed. So why is education not really moved forward in this rhyme? Now anybody know what this is? Periodic table of elements. Yes, how many elements in there? <laughs> 110, 140, 118, so somewhere between 100 and 130 maybe, right? We're all supposed to learn this. What does it actually say? But what does what these boxes actually mean? Yeah, it's a chart, right? And we're supposed to know what it is. Well, let me show you another chart in comparison. And it keeps on going <laughs> and going and going. I'm still going. <laughs> See, it's so big, it doesn't even fit on the screen. What if I told you you have to learn this chart and know by heart? Oh, great. Right, teacher, wonderful. Um, but, but what if I told you 10-year-olds know this chart by heart? What if I told you 10 years later they still know this chart by heart? What, really? Because I didn't have to learn a chart. That's a dual type abilities from Pokemon. Again, <laughs> hugely popular. And there's the data behind it. Even today, uh, over 27 million active users. Pokemon, really? That chart, periodic table of elements, 118 elements we can't remember, yet 10 years later, they still know this by heart. That's the power of games. Now, I hear you may say, games don't really belong in the classroom. Well, that's like saying books don't belong in the classroom. Um, I don't prescribe to that, because games are a medium, just like books. You have all types of books. You have recipe books, you have textbooks, you have reference books, you have comic books, all different types of books. And we have the same with games. We have all different types of games. We have puzzle games. We have adventure games, we have first-person shooter games, and we have games for learning. Let me show you some examples of games. Here's a game called Remission, you may have heard of. It's a game to help patients, young children, fight cancer very effectively. Here's another game, Folded, University of Washington. This is a game where players help scientists discover new proteins, well, a game for science. 1979, you take on the role of a journalist in Tehran and see the Iranian revolution from a very different perspective. Call it a historical or documentary game. And some of you may know this game, Kerber Space Program. Right? So physics in outer space, really um, you know, widely popular amongst children and it helps. Let me show you an example that was created right here at Texas A&M. Okay. 
Maybe not. Okay, the video didn't work. What a shame. Well, we created the first ever art history game right here at Texas A&M in the Life Lab with our students, with faculty, and with the help of Triceum. That game has shown research um, that we conducted 24.7% of student improvement after just two hours of gameplay. Why did we create the game? Well, here we have art history survey classes. These are large lecture classes where students get introduced to art. We say engineering students, business students, architecture students. The only time they ever hear about art is two semesters, 5,000 years of art, human art history. There's only so much they can get out of it. It's like trying to see Europe in a speed train in a week. How much are you going to remember? How much are you really going to understand about Europe? So the teacher, the professor that teach art history um, for like, well, maybe there is a better way to engage with our students to bring deeper context to the students through games, knowing that 97% of students play games every week, four hours or more. That's boys and girls. Now, they don't necessarily consider themselves gamers. Playing Candy Crush? Oh, no, I'm not a gamer, but I play Candy Crush. Solitaire? Yes, sure, but I'm not a gamer. You know, there's all kinds of games, board games, card games, video games. And we can utilize that power very effectively. Let me ask you a different... Oh, here's some responses, because this game has been used in classes and universities all around the country and now all around the world. In Poland, actually, teachers using this game to teach English to her students. Um, right here, coming from Texas A&M. What about other subjects? Can we do that? A 100 meter race, if you run 90 meters, what do you get? Nothing, right? Disqualified. You don't even get last place, because you didn't finish. 90 meters in a 100 meter race. Well, that's 90%. What do you get in a classroom if you get 90%? And hey, that's right. 90% will get you an A. Yet you actually only got 90%. What if I told you that airplane you're about to get onto, it's an A pilot. He's mastered the airplane 90%. <laughs> oh, and by the way, don't worry, the plane is in really great condition. It's 90% working. <laughs> How are you going to feel about that? I'm not going to feel that good about it. Thankfully, pilots are not educated that way. Uh, they're educated based really on mastery of the subject, not 90%. We don't do anything in the real world 90%. Everything is 100%. Right? But in education, 90%, and that's the A students. Imagine the B students, C students, and compounding works in education the same way as it does in finance. Over the years, the knowledge we leave on the table stacks up year over year over year. I'm about to show you another example of a game that was created right here and used. See if this works. Yes. From engineering to medicine to 3D graphics, calculus is foundational for all STEM careers. However, Calculus courses today have among the highest failure rates of any course on any campus. And there is a growing body of evidence that explicitly ties calculus to attrition in STEM degrees. At Tricium, our team collaborates with educators to address these complex educational issues and transform how students learn. Welcome to Variant Limits the first in a new series of immersive educational experiences for calculus students. Variant Limits brings calculus to life by transforming abstract ideas into creative and visually engaging challenges. As an explorer on a planet governed by calculus principles, students will discover a vibrant 3D world. Throughout the world, students will overcome obstacles by applying skills and concepts learned in class. Students will gain a new perspective on difficult topics such as limit laws, continuity, and the intermediate value theorem. 
and use their experiences within the game to construct and retain calculus knowledge. Variant Limits promotes conceptual understanding through direct interaction and immediate feedback in the game environment. By providing students an opportunity to take a more active role in the learning process, Variant engages and motivates students like no other learning tool. As students advance, learning is reported via the instructor portal, which provides detailed information and tracking tools. A revolutionary new way to teach calculus. An innovative tool to empower and engage students. The first in a series that will transform the calculus experience. Play to learn with variant limits. Now I can tell you this looks like homework I want to do, but the data speaks for itself. Students' is homework play an average of 10 times between two and four hours. I don't know any other homework students are willingly doing that often to get better to master a subject. And while our own studies are still ongoing, a teacher in Italy recently used this game in her class. Last year, 80% of her class succeeded. It was pretty good. This year, the first time she used the game in her class, and the rate went to 100%. Everybody mastered the subject. Not only did they master the subject, but the average grade went up by about 10% across the entire class. Now, that's pretty powerful. And the feedback we're getting from students and from teachers, the engagement is overwhelming. See, why did we create it? Because you heard many students are failing calculus. Um, and calculus is a foundation for any science, technology, engineering, architecture, business. Everybody has to do calculus. We have students enrolling in West Texas College, for example, to get their calculus credit, but they don't really learn calculus. What are we doing? We're not helping them. Is there another way, another tool that we can give teachers and students to really help them? Recently, a young lady came up to me at a conference and asked, so do you like math? Oh, my God, I, I hate it. Whoa, very strong words. Yeah, I'm in the classroom and the teacher keeps on going and I can't keep up. So I'm paying $300 a month for tutoring just to keep up because I know I'm going to need it in college you know, to succeed. But do you like games? Yeah, I play games. Well, sit down. She sat down and within an hour she's like, oh my God, I actually understand what this is about. And math is so much fun. I didn't realize it could be so much fun. Why shouldn't learning be fun? That's how we start off. Right? Think about failing in classroom. What do you get when you fail? And an F. Okay, well, let me try the test again. And another F. How motivating is that? Not very much. Right? Nobody likes to fail. Yet that's how we grade. In a game, you can't succeed. You can't finish a game unless you mastered 100%. You can't get to the next level with 98%. You have to get 100%. And not only do you have to get 100%, failing is fun. That's why students play over and over again. And you see that with many games, highly motivational. Imagine the situation. You're about to get to the airport. Thankfully, the pilot is fully trained. Airplane is fully working. You run, you're kind of running late. As you reach the gate, the airplane is just pulling off. There it is, the window seat that would have been yours. It's empty. You're standing on the other side. What's going to go through your head right now? First, you're going to be upset. Obviously, I'm not going to repeat the words that I've heard that people say <laughs> in that situation. And this, when I've asked, what's the next thing that goes through your head? Most people say, well, we're going to start planning. How do I get to my destination? Well, that's actually the third thing. Number two, you're going to think back on all the things that if they would have just gone a bit better, that would have made you sit in that airplane. The security line, if it would have just been a little bit shorter. The bus, if it would have just been on time, I could have made that plane. Well, what if I can tell you, I can rewind time and give you another try. You want to have another go at it? Do you want to try to get that airplane to go home for Christmas to see your family? Who's going to say no? 
You can't see it, it's right there. And you know what it's gonna take to succeed. Yes, of course I'm gonna try. Well, unfortunately in real life that doesn't happen. But in a game, I can rewind and you can try again. And I can show you what success looks like and how do you get there. And that's the power of game-based learning. We've taken this to a whole new level right here at Texas A&M, where the games become the center of the course, of the educational experience. No longer are they a supplement, but they're actually the focus um, for which students are learning. We have other materials around it, and we still have teachers, because games are not supposed to replace a teacher. Um, we still need teachers to teach. It's been so successful, and we've put on three courses this year, two for art history, one for calculus, and the engagement is through the roof. I mean, we, we don't have anything to compare it against because it's the first time it's ever done. And we're allowing now college students to earn credit in four weeks. It's only a single credit right now, and the plan is to have free courses for free credits. Hold on. That's 12 weeks. Isn't the semester 16 weeks? Yes, you're right. So you're saying 12 weeks? So we could reduce the time to earn college credit? We could increase mastery? And maybe, maybe even reduce the cost of education? Because I can get there faster and less time and having fun doing so. Just imagine that future for all of us and for our students. Thank you.